guests, welcome to uh, the final segment of Stratford's Legacy Series, In Good Company. Uh, my name is Tara Skye, and I'm here with my mom, Jenny Lozon. Um, hi. Hey, Katie. What started your career? Is there uh, any specific moment that you kind of went, this is what I want to do in my life for the rest of my life? My mom sent me to creative movement classes when I was in grade two. and. I remember distinctly the moment, like it was actually a very specific moment. And I was doing this improvisation where we were supposed to be little um, chickadees hatching from eggs. And it was, uh, you know, the, my, the teacher brought in a little portable record player and put on classical music. And I was chipping away at my, uh, my egg. And then I, I remember pecking my way out of the egg and coming out of the egg and going, wow, this is it. Like, I, this is really awesome, being able to tell a story with my body, with movement, and using my imagination. And it was just, it was such a distinct moment for me. And from then on, I was like, this is what I want to do. So it started with me being a chickadee, or a, a baby chicken, I guess. <laughs> And then it's expanded into like such a staple career base for you. And like you've done so many, so many jobs kind of like absolutely everywhere. And you're such a multidisciplinary artist. How, how did that happen? Do you think, where did, how did you start going into such different fields than specifically acting? You know, ever since I was a little girl, I used to sing with my mom in the car. Well, like we do when, cause we sing together a lot. <laughs> and harmonize and it's such a beautiful expression between mother and daughter and so my mom really encouraged me to sing so it was a very natural expression for me so uh, singing was always a part of uh, what I did creatively but I had a hard time speaking I had a hard time bringing my voice into the world and so my initial training was in mime and mask and clown which allowed me to really express myself as a as an artist but through nonverbal mediums so I had this stream of singing and then this stream of, of training in mime and mask and clown. But then I had this love of Shakespeare. And that came from my foster father because he, he was a high school drama teacher. He ran the community theater. And we would sit around at night reading Shakespeare plays out loud and analyzing them. And I, I fell in love with Shakespeare. Eventually, I found a way to kind of put all those things together. But it really took me a while to figure out how those things were all related. Do you have a uh, influence that you kind of just went, hey, look at that person. I want to be like that. Or like someone who helped you physically throughout your career that you just really want to shout out and appreciate? I'd have to go back to my foster father, Paul Kershaw, who, who uh, and my foster mother, Carol, who, when I left high school, said, yes, go, go off and be an artist. It's an honor to be an artist. And so I had that kind of support, you know, leaving, leaving home, leaving their home. Yeah. But I've also had the opportunity to study with some, some pretty incredible masters. I didn't get into any of the theater schools that I auditioned for. Unlike you, who just graduated from the National Theater School last May and auditioned and got in, I auditioned twice and didn't get into NTS or any of the other schools that I auditioned for. So I sought out masters and people. And Richard Pachinko, David Smuckler, Patsy Rodenberg, Yoshi Oida were some of my biggest influences in terms of helping to shape how I was training myself as an actor. So mm -hmm. I, I feel really lucky that I was able to work with some incredible masters and elders over the years too have also, uh, while not theater artists in, in, in terms of the elders that I've worked with, they've also helped shape me and who I am and who I am as an artist. So I'm really thankful for the plethora of people that I've had in my life that have really guided me. How has it been like as a Indigenous, like a BIPOC person, Indigenous person, um, going through that journey in the 80s, trying to find people to train you? What was that like for you? That's a, oh boy, that could be an hour discussion for sure. A three hour discussion, really. Um, so as an, I say IBPOC, uh, I put the Indigenous first. Um, you know, when I started out in the 70s, we were in a much different time than we are now. As an example for Shakespeare, which I, I just love Shakespeare. Um, and I know that a lot of Indigenous people look at Shakespeare as a, as a white guy. <laughs> 
a, a European white guy, an English white guy, and what you know, why do we have to do his, his material? But I've found a way into the text that really works for me. But that only came out of the fact that when I first started studying Shakespeare, I was basically told that I could join the class, but that there would never be an, a, a place for me on a stage doing Shakespeare. And so I kind of set out to prove them wrong. As you know, as you know me, that's kind of my thing. It was a very different time in the 70s and the 80s. And so in, in many ways, that teacher was right. There wasn't a place for me. There was no place for me at Stratford. There was no place for me in a lot of the main stages in Canada. And there was very little space or place for me doing the classics, uh, which was something that I was interested in doing. So what I developed was a way of looking at that material, not through a classical lens, but through an indigenous lens. So when I look at Shakespeare now, I look at bringing my living culture to the work. And I got that phrase from uh, Peter Brook, actually, uh, a book that I was reading about how he looked at multicultural casting and how he asks his multicultural cast to bring their living culture to the work. I've had the great opportunity to, um, as an actor who is Indigenous, play some great roles like Mark Antony, um, uh, Shylock, uh, Lady Capulet, um, and lots of clowns, uh, and the Fool and Cordelia. So I, I feel very blessed that I've been able to explore the idea of doing classical text, but through an Indigenous actor's lens. It wasn't until the 1990s where Indigenous theatre actually started to really find a foundation here in Canada. And so while I appreciate the time that you're in, the opportunities that you'll have that are different than mine, I had to look at myself as an actor who was Indigenous first, whereas I think you can look at yourself as an Indigenous actor, mm -hmm. applying yourself to a number of different opportunities and luckily the times are changing but I don't know do you feel that do you feel as a young artist just graduated that that's how you identify yourself in the world or I mean yeah I think there are some like occasional hiccups where like I go into the room and like I have to leave my indigeneity at the door I have to leave um, my experiences at the door and I think that's also just a comment on how um, theater schools are are Kind of constructed at the moment but definitely times are changing and i i i mean you and i have had this conversation a couple of times about like how how the conversation has been going on for years like yeah. so many years and it's now that people are really starting to like understand the, the history and the depth and the roots of like where we come from and why we can't do the same things you and i are both like very mixed blood and like i'm as white passing as they come so like I can just kind of like sometimes just play white characters and be okay with that but it's it's definitely interesting going like but but what if we look at it this way but what if like I bring in my mixed bloodness this way and I've had uh directors who uh totally accept that and who totally don't so kind of exciting to see what's what's now possible for you. And, I, and I'm glad that you brought up the fact that there were so many before us because, because there have been, like you stand on my shoulders, I stand on the shoulders of so many before us who've been really knocking down and really trying to knock down the solid brick wall in terms of you know, being invited in. And even the act of being invited in is kind of weird. Like we shouldn't be invited in, we should just be welcome, you know, <laughs> like, or, yeah. you know, or be running the rooms, but. Um, but I'm excited to see what kind of rich art might be possible as a result of multicultural casts coming together and and everyone finding an intersection into the story. Speaking of uh, indigeneity and Shakespeare, you Shakespeare geek, um, do you want to talk about your experience with like King Lear, the King Lear production at the NAC with the uh, the entirely Indigenous cast? You know, Peter Hinton was another one of those really incredible people in my life. I, I had hit a wall, uh, I'd had a really tough year, and Peter called me and said, would you like to come and work at the NAC? And I said, yes, please. 
And I was able to do some really incredible work with Peter as a director, you know, someone that I absolutely adore and respect so deeply. And so when he was finally able to bring Augie Schellenberg's vision of doing an all Aboriginal King Lear to fruition, I was really excited to be involved. I thought he made a mistake though, when he, he invited me into a meeting and he said, I'd love to offer you the role of Cordelia and the fool. And I thought, I thought he made a mistake because I was in my 50s at the time and I got Cordelia is the youngest daughter and I said I said you I'm sorry I didn't hear you right but that's what he meant and so I was able to do Cordelia and the Fool and the beauty of that production is that it was deeply rooted in Algonquin culture. There was consultations with community. There was consultations with elders. There was an opportunity to bring that community whose land we were on into the process. We all had a different relationship to the work as a result of it. The challenges were that as a, a group of Indigenous actors coming together from a number of different nations, we had to find a way of navigating and working together because we're not all the same. We come from different perspectives in terms of how we look at the drum, how we place the drum, how we uh, take care of the drum. And so we were guided by the Algonquin elders, uh, which was, uh, you know, a, a very lovely thing. But it was so beautiful to see all those amazing Indigenous actors on stage doing Shakespeare, and it was amazing working with Augie Schellenberg. I will never, ever forget that experience. I, I remember you talking about it, like when it was going on, and that was a, uh, you have a history with the NAC, like specifically, um, just like working with Peter Hinton at the NAC and a couple of other people. I remember having to relocate my entire life for three months and, uh, <laughs> Uh, moving to Ottawa while you did two shows at the NAC and just like oh living in a one room hotel just <laughs> fighting all the time because I was what 11 years old so and the, and then the, and I did try to homeschool you and rehearse and do a show all and the time. what has it been like being a single parent in the industry and uh, just trying to raise me while doing all of the work that you've done. I don't know why I'm getting teary, but I'm getting teary at the moment. <laughs> I think it's because when I look back on it, I, it's hard for me to realize that I, I was actually able to accomplish that. Holy crap. Um, what I had, a, I had a male, a white male director very well-respected white male director tell me at one point that I should not be in the industry as a single parent. You know, he said to me, like, this industry requires a level of dedication and commitment and discipline that you can't accomplish as a single parent. And I, I, it hurt me deeply, but I laughed so hard at him because I said, I, like, in my mind, I was like, try just being a single parent. That's the ultimate definition of commitment and discipline and, and so the lucky thing about that as you know me I used that as fuel for my fire to prove him wrong but what it did give me was an opportunity to see how you were growing in those experiences and although it was tough for us one of the things that I kept seeing was how it was also shaping your world and your experience mm -hmm. you're very good at navigating rooms of adults you're very good at you know the constant movement and change that was necessary and you also developed this amazing way of um, not trusting adults right away, but needing to gain their respect and trust. And I and I, I appreciate all of those things that it taught us both. And I'm really appreciative of the relationship that we have as a result of the time that we spent together. So I so many great things came out of it. But you know, three quarters of my salary went towards childcare. <laughs> so it wasn't financially great, but you know, the artistic outcome for both of us, I think has been the bonus part. And I mean, speaking of a, as a second generation actor, like having the ability to just know what I'm getting myself into and like know the work and the dedication that it takes to be an artist, uh, an Indigenous artist, a female artist. When I went up to you and I was like, 
I want to be an actor. And you're like, are you sure? <laughs> you know what it takes. I'm like, I know I'm, I'm willing. I want to do it. <laughs> you're like, okay, go to NTS. Yeah. And full disclosure to everyone. I wasn't sure that Tara would get into NTS because it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard to get into NTS. So I was trying to be like, well, you know, if you don't get in this year, you'll just, you work so hard, you know, you hired a coach because it's not good for me to coach you <laughs> and you really worked hard and you're a great actor. Can't wait to see what you're going to do with your, once this is all over, what you're going to, what's, what possibilities. Well, you know, you would have been at Stratford this season. So I would have, you know, I think that speaks to your dedication and, and, um, and the, the work ethic that you have as an actor. And I just was so looking forward to being there on opening night for you. I know, I was looking forward to being at your yeah. opening night at, uh, on the Red Sisters. I was looking forward to like seeing you play Felizia again, because I remember you and Michaela Watford and Terry Hayes just like up on the stage together. I'm like, oh, I don't wanna be there would have been the second Indigenous production at Stratford, uh, the first one being 2002. So that's quite a big time frame. Um, but I am appreciative of the fact that I, I understand and I feel that Stratford's commitment to uh, be more inclusive of Indigenous productions um, yeah. is, is the way that they'll be moving forward. And I'm excited to see uh, what that means in the future. And then hopefully we'll be back at Stratford together again, because that would be pretty awesome. That was pretty cool. Speaking of Stratford, your uh, debut, so to speak, at Stratford was in two, 2017. Um, do you want to, do you have any, like, thoughts about why, why it took you so long to get to Stratford? Because um, you've been doing so much work your entire life and, and uh, yeah, thoughts? You know, folks were pretty clear early on in my career that there really wasn't a place for me there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the way that it was contextualized to me was, was around the color of my skin. I would love to say that I wasn't as good an actor then as I was about 15, 20, 20 years later, where I really settled into becoming the artist that I am now. So I take full responsibility for the fact that my auditions probably weren't as good as they could have been as well. But then, then I realized that if there wasn't really a place for me at Stratford, I wasn't going to wait. I wasn't going to wait. Uh, and I wasn't going to make, if, if I wasn't seeing myself on the stage at Stratford, if I wasn't represented there, if, I, if there wasn't an opportunity, the same kind of opportunity that I had with other companies to play Shylock, to play Mark Antony. I wanted to play those roles. And so I went to the companies that were offering me those opportunities. And what I realized was that I needed to just create my own career. I wasn't going to wait for somebody to actually bring me in. You know, I was honored to be asked by Renata Arlok to come in and do the breathing hole. I had a combination of the puppetry skills and the acting skills that she needed in the role of Mutuk. And as you know, everything for me in our house is a puppet. So the the opportunity to do puppetry and and body puppetry playing a polar bear was just out of this world fantastic and so i am really thankful for that opportunity to you know get inside that bear and you know the, the puppetry aspect for me was just so so amazing and you know that was a very popular show it told a very heart-wrenching story so i guess we'll see where that relationship goes from there I'm excited about the future. I think there's more possibilities for me at Stratford now, which is great. I feel that there's more possibilities for actors like you at Stratford as well, which is part of that shift and change that's happening that is pretty darn exciting, I'll tell you. Never yeah. thought in my lifetime that we would get here, but happy to know that we're, we, ha we are arriving. Speaking about puppets, do you want to talk a little bit about your time as, uh, as Granny on Mr. Dress Up? You know, I have my mother to thank for that, actually. And now I've passed that on to you, I think. There's that mother lineage again. Because my mother was a doll maker. As you know, we have a lot of her dolls around the house. And my mom told me when I was very little that every doll that she made had a soul. And every doll that I had of hers, or every doll that I had, I was one of those kids that had a bed that was 
primarily covered with dolls and then there was a little space for me. And every doll had a story, a background, a soul, and she was very good at manipulating the dolls. And so we, when we played dolls together, like there, w there was this amazing life that happened. And so because of my mime and my mask training, when Jim Henson came to Toronto, I was able to study with Richard Hunt and, and the Henson team and, uh, and work on Fraggle Rock and, and, the Sh and Jim Henson Hour and that was those sorts of things. And so that, that was pretty incredible. And that led to my opportunity to audition for and play then be cast as granny in the Mester Dress Up show. So both Henson and his team and also Ernie Coombs, who I just adored, you know, such an amazing part of my overall career. It was just such an honor to work with him and to get fan mail as granny. Like I got fan mail as granny, you know, like the, these little kids who just looked up to granny so much and yeah, I, they're just such great memories for me. I, I'm, I, I feel very lucky and blessed to have had the career that I've had so far. I have lots of plans. Love to do more directing, more acting for sure, but I've been very blessed so far. I mean, you and I have been talking about possibly trying to get you to direct me at some point. Because I've been writing my own material, you know, for the last several years, starting Turtle Gals and then my own company, I think you've grown up with that as well. The idea that to build a career in this industry, it's very good to diversify in terms of skill sets. And so, you know, writing and creating your own work is, is I think, an important part of surviving as an artist in Canada, but also getting to know who you are as an artist as a result of that. So yeah, I can, I'm looking forward to seeing where that might go with us. Thanks. Um, speaking of Turtle Gals, you mentioned to me before that there was like a specific need uh, as to why you created, uh, a need in the world as to why you created Turtle Gals. Do you want to speak a bit more about that? Turtle Gals Performance Ensemble was created in 1999, which, and you were one year old, oh my goodness. We called you a turtle in training, yeah. <laughs> so it was a company that I, I co-founded with Monique Mujica and Michelle St. John. And really at that time, um, again, uh, what there was in terms of Indigenous theatre was primarily written by men. And we, we really wanted to make sure that our voices were heard. Mm -hmm. um, we were also very inspired by the work of Spider Woman Theater, who really profoundly changed the way that we look at in Indigenous theater making today. And so we started Turtle Gals as a way to uh, collectively create projects, our first one being uh, the Scrubbing Project, in order to be able to tell our stories. It was a great legacy. We had eight years together as a company, and I think the Scrubbing Project was the kind of project where you know people either really loved it or they just didn't understand the aesthetic of it. But it catapulted me when Turtle Gals uh, was closed as a company to open my own company in order to create my own work with you know, Prophecy Fog, which was recently a Dora nominated show, a one woman show that I really hope to tour the world with. And I call myself Princess, which is based on the life of Chinita Redfeather as a mezzo soprano at the turn of the century, an opera based on her life, which was the very first American opera at the Met in, in New York City in 1918. Like these are stories that I get really excited about because there's so many amazing indigenous performers uh, you know, from the 1800s uh, to present day that, uh, that we really need to celebrate. And writing is a way for us to do that, you know? Yeah. I'm never going to sit back and just wait for somebody to hire me. I'm always active in terms of looking at creating new material or finding new ways for me to engage. What's your next plan? Like, what are your plans for the future? You know, as we hit those milestones of we would have been at Stratford opening a show or we would have been in our first day of rehearsal or we would have been opening another, sh another show or we would have been in tech. It's, we're still going through those milestones and I'm still grieving that. I was really looking forward to being back at Stratford this summer. I was really looking forward to engaging with Stratford audiences with the Res Sisters. Um, I was really, in, in, really looking forward to engaging in the discussion that would have come up around that play. Um, and so I, I still feel a bit stuck in the grieving process. 
I'm very lucky also in that I have developed a career as an artist educator. As you know, I ran the Center for Indigenous Theatre for a number of years. That has allowed me to you know, be invited to the National Theatre School to teach there. So I'm working with the first year and now second year, we'll be going into working with the second year students on a devised project. And I'm very excited about that. It's a great group of students. I'm trying to look at artist education from an inclusive way of working. I'm trying to look at artist education and the Devise project uh, from those concepts of bringing living culture to the work. I have this continued um, three prong part to my career and one of them is uh, touring my own show, Prophecy Fog, which I really would love to take around the world. I think the timing, the message of the story is important. I will never want to give up my career as an actor. I love being an actor on the stage, but I also really must be doing something right in terms of my directing career. I've had some great shows in the last little while with The Monument at Factory, which was mm -hmm. a hard hitting production, Colleen Wagner's piece, which again, we put through an indigenous lens of murdered and missing indigenous women. Almighty Voice and His Wife, which I was just nominated for as a director for Dora and Rope at the Shaw Festival. So, uh, which were all successful productions that I'm very, very proud of. So I guess we'll just have to sort of wait and see where that takes me because unfortunately the majority of my work as well as yours, uh, as well as everyone's has all been canceled until who knows when in the future. But I do have two plays that I'm writing. Uh, one with Caitlin Reardon called 1939 and it's been an amazing process working with Caitlin. I'm excited about the project. We were commissioned by Stratford for first draft so we've got that done. I love the process of writing with Caitlin so uh, I look forward to the next draft which we're mm -hmm. about to kind of jump into and then there's another project that I'm working on which is in its very infancy stages of research uh, which is something that I can do during this COVID period. So really trying to make sure that I make use of my time. And then you and I have some little projects that we've been involved with, with yeah. um, Urban Vessel. And it's been a pleasure working with you, Tara. I have to admit, it's been really, really awesome to uh, come together as equals and to really bounce off your ideas, which are strong and interesting, and to be able to create together. Um, it's been, I'm, I'm really excited about where that might go. This has been a long and very lovely conversation with your mom. Thanks to Stratford for giving us this opportunity. And any last words? I think we're in a very interesting time where voices are being heard, finally, where the world is listening on a different level. I'm hoping that we can learn to listen and learn and do it with a lot of patience and kindness and understanding. The core of the word ignorance is ignore. And we're at a really beautiful place right now where we can't ignore anymore. So we can't ignore, so the ignorance hopefully will, will go away. I'm hoping that we can move forward together in a good way, in right relationship with each other. So that's mm -hmm. my hope. Lovely. Thank Thanks, Tara. It's been it's been fun chatting with you. <laughs> Same here. <laughs>